Well, hello, everybody. As you all know, my lecture on the color green is part of a sequence devoted to the rainbow. And I've been asked to give the color green, partly because I'm Irish and partly because the subject I've chosen to talk about today is really the landscape and, above all, the way in which the contrast between nature and nurture can be found in Irish gardening. The color wheel and the rainbow is composed of a variety of colors. We call them the primaries and the secondaries. The primaries are made up of blue and red and yellow. And then the secondaries are made up of mixtures of those three. The color green is a secondary color. And the way in which green reacts came home to me strikingly, not so much as a gardener, but as an art historian. As many of you will know, when you go to a historic house or a museum, there are many medieval tapestries where the forest seems to be various shades of blue rather than green. The reason being that green is made up of mixture of blue and yellow. And certainly in medieval times, the yellow dye was fluid. It, it fled from the, the texture of the tapestry. And so that's why so many medieval tapestries look blue. In landscape and in art, it's rather different. I want to talk to you also a little bit about the contrast, as I said, between nature and nurture. So to begin, I want to take you to Ireland, to County Wicklow, often referred to as the Garden of Ireland. And I want to look at three gardens or three landscapes where the approach is quite striking and different. You're looking at a valley in the folds of the Wicklow Hills called Lugalaw. Lugalaw is part of a great big natural landscape where man has had very little to do with it over the years. If we move further down into the valley, you will see that there is at the far end a white house, a rather splendid Gothic folly from the late 18th, early 19th century. That, to be honest, is the only involvement of man in this totally unspoiled landscape. And that, of course, reflects the approach of the 18th and 19th centuries. If we were to drive from Lugalaw about 20 miles to the south, we would arrive at another garden, this time one which is rather more manicured and rather more planned, and this is Mount Usher. Again, we have a valley, but composed really of this river, a small river, and a landscape stretching away to left and right. This landscape was created by two brothers called the Walpoles, but really the garden is not so much theirs, it is the garden of the man who inspired them, William Robinson, one of the founders of arts and crafts gardening. And so in the development of the garden, we see a very cunning use of what we all know is the four elements, earth, which is the material from which everything grows, water, which is what gives it moisture in order to grow, air, which is what helps the plants to breathe, and also fire, not so much physical fire, but a metaphorical fire supplied through the extraordinary range of acers that are planted throughout the garden, which burn with fierce reds and oranges in the course of the autumn season. We now move to the other side of the Wicklow Mountains, and we're at a garden called Hunting Brook, except this first image would not suggest a garden where a man has had much involvement. Hunting Brook is the creation of a remarkable young man called Jimmy Blake. And when he inherited part of the family farm, he took this valley and decided to leave it more or less alone. Gradually but gradually, as we move up the hill uh, to where he lives, Jimmy's involvement becomes more apparent. And so here you have a little piece of, well, soft ground which has been cleared in order to create a space for al fresco meals almost as if you were expecting in the course of an evening to bump into a group of leprechauns having fun. If we move up the side of the valley to where Jimmy lives, in recent years, 10 or more, he's created an extraordinary garden. And I want to show you the same part of the garden at different times of the season so that you can understand what can be done with flair and imagination. Our first image of Hunting Brook in its formal sense is devoted to the spring display of tulips for which the garden is renowned. An extraordinary range of colors, almost like a smarty box, has been emptied of its contents all over the ground and has set seed 
and become incredibly fecund. The next image shows you the same spot a little bit later in the year. Now those strong vertical accents which you saw a moment ago, Aurelia trees, they're given context by the wonderful combination of Philippendula, which is the wavy pink material, and the lovely steeper grass, and many other pieces of colorful rudbeckias and the like. These three gardens represent a variety of approaches to, if you like, the husbandry of the landscape. I now want to turn to two gardens which are, if you like, standing at the opposite ends of what one would describe as the finest tradition of gardening on the island of Ireland. The first one is in County Down, and it's called Mount Stuart. As you look at Mount Stuart, the house itself is, for the most part, an 18th century core with many late, later additions. The house was built by a family of Scottish planters called Stuart, a very common name in the north of Ireland. However, the family became rather grand and important, and their name changed to Vane Tempest Stuart, ultimately becoming the Marquesses of Londonry. And at Mount Stuart, in the early 20th century, the then Marchioness, Edith, created one of the greatest gardens of recent times. Edith Londonry came to gardening in Middle Age. She found a situation where there was a formal park, a large house, and rather more grass than was strictly necessary. And so over the next 30 or so years, she developed the landscape to create a series of not so much rooms, but areas of interest. Some of these are driven by horticulture, and some of them have a much more, if you like, deeper purpose that is not always obvious to those who visit. If we look at the formal so-called Italianate garden laid out on one side of the house, you have a slightly sunken bed laid out in a formal uh, fashion. You have a whole variety of colors, very much her personal taste. But as we see in this detail, one of the combinations that she was very keen on was the combination of orange and blue. Now, orange and blue uh, are colors that are frequently put together but here, it's not just a horticultural choice. It has, if you like, a political point as well. If we come round the corner to the other side of the house, there is uh, the sunken red hand arrangement. This area, if we look at it from the garden towards the garden front of the house, you will see that there's rather a lot of orange, for some rather too much. If we now look down onto that plot from the roof of the house, what do we see? We see pergola, which bounds the space on three sides. And then we also have, just beyond it, beyond a hedge, we can see a hand, the red hand of Ulster, which is laid out in a form of formal bedding. When we go closer into that space, we have the red hand, we have the shamrock within which it is set, and then we also have the Irish harp. Edith Londonry and her husband were of the unionist political tradition. And when this garden was made, the fledgling state of Northern Ireland had just been established. And the family were making a very particular point. They were on the island of Ireland, but they were above all Ulster, hence the heraldic symbol for Ulster, the famous red hand. And everywhere in the garden, orange and blue is found. Why? Because the unionist tradition is loyal to the memory of William of Orange, and if you know your European heraldry, the heraldic colors of the House of Orange is orange and blue. As I said, most people would never notice this when going round, but it shows you that gardening can also have another point. We now move to the south, and we move to Helen Dillon's garden, which for many years was the go-to garden for all garden enthusiasts in Ireland and visiting the country. I say it was the go-to place because sadly, the garden is no more. The Dillons found the garden too much, they've moved on, and now the garden has been taken out and something very different is in its place. For me, it's a personal garden because I've known it really for 30, 40 years. And in the few images I'm going to show you, we look at the way in which Helen has developed her approach to gardening in the following way. This first image, is really the garden at its outset. When the Dillons bought this house, the garden they found was, if you like, an essay in municipal 
low maintenance. Rather simple beds edged with stone with one or two unwelcome additions from the Victorian catalogue of a fountain maker. Well, the fountain went and then the garden began to evolve and develop. Structure, above all, became important. Steps, newly edged paths with old stone, a recreated lawn giving this great big piece of green, which allowed Helen to develop a planting scheme. To begin with, that scheme was, I suppose, devoted to the surrounding landscape, making the trees from the other gardens sit within the, the boundary of the place. And then it all began to change. And you'll see this when we move to the next image, where a much more sophisticated approach to gardening has developed. Here we have somebody who has looked very closely at the whole way in which colour can be used. And all the colours, uh, primary, secondary, and indeed tertiary, are used here. The lawn went, in went the pathways, composed of Kilkenny limestone, in went the water feature, inspired by the Alhambra, and then the planting. To begin with, on one side, as you'll see in this image, warm, hot colours, again held together by green as the, if you like, the warp of the design. The threads being then, or the weft threads, being the various plants. If we move to the other side, we see an extraordinary sea of blue and purpley blue to violet, the cool side of the colour spectrum. Here, delphiniums, aconitums, and lovely silver white planting brought in by that very useful plant, Cranby cordifolia, which is the sea kale. Well, that is the way in which a true genius uses colour. When we return to this final image of the garden, we see the way in which the four elements are brought together with great authority. The earth from which the plants grow, the air which gives them their space, the water which nurtures them through moisture, and the sense of fire which comes through the choice of planting. In conclusion, as we come to the end of this presentation on green, I hope you realise that gardens are not quite what they seem. They can be artless and natural, as we saw at Lugalaw. They can be political and full of hidden meaning, as we saw at Van Stuart. And they can display rare imagination and talent in the combination of not just the elements that make up nature, but also the way in which colour can enliven and enrich our lives. Thank you.